Expanding our dialogue with officers, we'll delve into their understanding of which acts could put an officer at risk for decertification. But first, our journey takes us to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, where I met with post executives and advisory board members to hear their perspective on how they think this legislation came about. What do you think was the catalyst that causes, caused the changes in police decertification? I think it was, um more of a national thing that happened. You get news now. So you don't have to wait for tomorrow morning for the newspaper to come out. When it finally dawned on somebody that there was no way to decertify a peace officer, that was kind of mind blowing. You know, a, your hairstylist can lose their license, a doctor, a lawyer, your contractor, all these people have processes in place. They're all required to be licensed because the legislature has essentially made a formative statement that without some form of oversight or regulation, the public is vulnerable to actions by these professionals. I think that's what the community is looking at and looking for, is that they are being held to the same standards as they are as a normal citizen. They don't want to see them being able to lose their job here, but then be hired at another agency. It also creates some level of transparency, mul multiple levels of transparency. Departments are now required to con conduct internal investigations, even if that person is going to separate. And they have to report that result to the state. And I think we're still trying to build um, on educating peace officers and agencies across the state to help them understand that we still want to be involved as a proactive organization to help prevent, if we can, to some degree, some of these acts of serious misconduct, because that's in the benefit of everybody. Prevention often starts with knowledge, and I'm wondering what our officers understand regarding how serious misconduct is interpreted under this new legislation. So let me ask you all this about the uh, serious misconduct. What's your knowledge or understanding of how that's defined and what's included. There's, there's questions as to what's going to qualify um, as serious misconduct. And I mean, can that change from reviewer to reviewer? You might find serious misconduct different than what I find serious misconduct. There's no like, there's no definition of what it is, pretty much what he was saying. So it sounds like your understanding is it's that it's very subjective and it depends upon who's reviewing. I've never seen like a hard definition as to what they're looking for. It's a big question mark. Um, that can cause a lot of stress and anxiety for our officers. So I'm going to ask Andrew, is, is there a definition of serious misconduct? There is a definition of serious misconduct. So when the new law came in, there were specific definitions of serious misconduct, which were enumerated uh, in the penal code. And then part of post's responsibility, actually the post commission's responsibility, was to adopt a definition of serious misconduct. And that actually is contained within our regulations under 1205. So that has been narrowed, actually. The best place to find it is from our post regulations. That's going to be the most up-to-date version of whatever definition of serious misconduct there is. While the entire definition of the nine acts of serious misconduct are available here in Commission Regulation 1205, the post website lists each with an abridged description that's worth walking through. Dishonesty, relating to the reporting, investigation, or prosecution of a crime or relating to the reporting of or investigation of misconduct by a peace officer. Abuse of power, including but not limited to intimidating witnesses, knowingly obtaining a false confession, and knowingly making a false arrest. Physical abuse, including but not limited to the excessive or unreasonable use of force. Sexual assault as described in Subdivision B of Penal Code 832.7, and shall extend to acts committed amongst members of any law enforcement agency. Demonstrating bias on the basis of actual or perceived race, national origin, religion, gender identity or expression, housing status, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, or other protected status in violation of law or department policy, or inconsistent with a peace officer's obligation to carry out their duties in a fair and unbiased manner. Acts that violate the law 
and are sufficiently egregious or repeated as to be inconsistent with a peace officer's obligation to uphold the law or respect the rights of members of the public. Participation in a law enforcement gang. Failure to cooperate with an investigation into potential police misconduct. And failure to intercede when present and observing another officer using force that is clearly beyond that which is necessary as determined by an objectively reasonable officer under the circumstances. The definitions for the nine acts are a lot to take in and deserve closer examination. When we read through these, what are we seeing? When you look at those nine areas of misconduct, the, the categories that are involved there really are serious misconduct. And the reality is our officers aren't doing those or engaging in those types of activities on their day-to-day -day contacts. I think what the fear is is what someone might report. And, it, and we had some of the same concerns with the, when we first started using body-worn cameras. Well, but what we found is that mo and most of the time the camera has supported the actions of the officers. And so if they're aware of what those areas of misconduct are, if they're just following policy and, and being good people and out doing their job and performing it as best they can, they don't really have anything to worry about with serious misconduct. When you really look at what it is, you see that these are things that pretty much every officer in the state agrees that uh, folks who engage in this misconduct do not belong amongst our ranks. And so while it can be daunting and scary because it is something new, uh, I think once folks really have an understanding of what it is, I think they would agree and that there's a tremendous amount of value in it. I don't think anybody that wants to advance this profession wants those people remaining in the profession. And having the process in place to ensure that these folks that have con basically committed these serious acts of misconduct really should be working in their community or any community. It's pretty clear that understanding the types of acts that constitute serious misconduct matters to officers working today. Next time, we'll look into the kinds of cases that POST is currently acting on and find information about decertified officers that has been made available to the public. For additional information and resources related to certification and decertification, including the Commission's definition of serious misconduct, access the POST website at the link below.